Mazel morons, welcome back to the Good Guys podcast. We are here with David Crumholtz. Oh no. The great actor. Just, oh no. Just to, How are you doing, Josh? Uh, better now. To read off just a couple of your incredible credits. Let's uh -oh. just, we let's just go, start. Oh, Jesus, because we didn't, we didn't, <laughs> you didn't check, we didn't go through this prior. I have no idea what you're about to read. Go ahead. Well, there's the Santa Claus. God help us all. One of the greats. Mm -hmm. Adam's Family Values, Life with Mikey. That's just starting. Okay. Let's jump 10 years. 10 Things I Hate About You, classic. Mm. So good. Um, Harold and Kumar go to White Castle. Mm. Great. Super bad. Walk hard. And now Oppenheimer. To well, first yeah, of all, Tony Award winner. Years that you skipped over, but that's good. That's probably a good thing. That's what I want people to do with years. my career. <laughs> um, well, listen, I, the way I say it is this. A lot of rappers in the game got a lot of credits, but I'm a rapper who has a lot of classics. And that's the, the difference. Uh, I just, I just line up, I just pile up classics. Yeah, you do. And, um, if I were a braggadocious rapper, uh, I would, uh, that would be my thing, you know? Um, and I kind of approach acting like, uh, being an MC in the sense that, uh, you know, it's it is highly competitive, and I and I want to uh, destroy the competition. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Finally, someone's. I'm so tired of these actors being so happy for other actors. It's bullshit. No. Well, it, wait. It, I, is it a lie? Hold on, Josh. I am agreed happy for other. I am happy for other actors. But you want to smash them both. You want to smash them. Well, I, I want to. I already have. Hey. <laughs> well, didn't we forget? It. Didn't we forget Sausage Party, Josh? Mm, That's there's just a sausage party. Yeah. I mean, Wait. how did you forget sausage party? Yeah. How do you forget a thing like that? And I mean, if you want me to, I'll fill in some other blanks, but I'm not going to. That would be <laughs> pathetic. You should. No, you should. You should. Did you come? Well, you should. I mean, please. I did the lead of a small movie that no one really ever saw. Originally, it was called Teddy Bears, mm. and they changed the title when they put it out to The Big Ask which is a terrible title to promote because you have to <laughs> exasperate the K right. or else people think you're saying the movie's called The Big Ass. And I happen to show my ass in the movie. Right. And it's not big. In fact, it's inverted. It's one of those. <laughs> and, Ge uh, Jewish. Yeah. We call that a Jewish ass. You know, I know a couple of big butt Jews. Big booty butt, Jews? Big booty Jews. BBJs? They, they exist. But yeah, you're right. I find for the most part that Jews, we hold our weight in our upper body. You'll find like a nice 34, 36 jean and like mm. a triple X Rochester big and tall esque polo. Mm. And so I find it's more of a flat ass. <laughs> I have chicken legs. Are you uh, saying, you go. are you guys saying from ankle to femur where we could be Gentile, but as soon yes. as you get above the hip bone, all Jew. Yes. And also yeah. below the ankle, we're all Jew. Our feet. Flat. Are considerably fucked up. Flat. Flat as a board. We also have the longer <laughs> second toe. We have like a like something going second, on. But I, I thought that yeah. implied royalty. Didn't has anybody ever told you like if you have a longer toe yeah. than your your big toe that you 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 come from a line of royalty? They've said predict but, the but, weather. By the way, Judaism and line of royalty are one and the same. We are oh. we're incredibly proud Jews here. I'm just simply pointing out a couple yeah. of our flaws, but for the most part, we're we're well, it's killing good to it. know that the two of you are proud Jews. Um, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I'm not listening. To, I'm not. I'm, uh, listening. You're like yeah. I hate Jews. <laughs> um. Ben Ben's out here just uh, fueling more fire for anyone who's. <laughs> who's... By the way, Ben Ben, you are looking. Um, it, I don't know if it's just the active wear, um, and also purple is not a color most people can pull off. But I gotta say, you're looking trim. You're looking tight. You're My looking man. great. Thank you. Mr. Krumholtz, if you met me uh, probably a year ago, I was 60 pounds heavier. Oh, my. So I, was, I, was, a, uh, I was also 60 pounds heavier a year ago. Uh, I credit it to originally Ozempic, and now I'm just a workout beast. Oh, uh, wow. And Josh, yes, I did, hit my, I did hit my low yesterday, actually. I'm down to 236. I was 290. I was 290. Wow, so. wow, wow. I was 230, uh, and I credit it all to Ozempic. Wow. I've been on Ozempic for a while. 
No way. You two are brothers in syringe. In Ozempic, yeah. Brothers in inject. Ama- yeah. Amazing. Do you ever mm-hmm. talk about it? Like I, I personally talk about it all the time and, and I'm quite I do. Proud I of brag it. about it. I'm proud of it too because it's saving yeah. people's, it's going to save people's lives. Yes. There's so much, you know, oh my God. And then there's this sort of weird shame like, oh, you know, uh, you're cheating and uh, you're so Hollywood. And it's like, no, it kind of saved my life. Totally. I lost 60 pounds and I was heavy as hell and my, my back was killing me and I probably had high cholesterol and all kinds of things. I'm pre-diabetic and all that. Mm. Now I'm not. So fuck you. Yeah. Congrats to you. Me Josh, we need, to intru- we need to introduce him to Terry Dubrow, Dr. Dubrow. All that we do unintentionally on this podcast is talk about obesity and talk about Ozempic. Mm. So, welcome, so welcome home. Welcome yeah. home. Welcome. It's a safe and, space. And light Shabbat candles, I'm guessing, as well, because that would go. Yeah. That's the tr- the and, ba- and beg for ad dollars. Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> Not anymore, Josh. Not anymore. <laughs> well, we're, we're done ben with got, that. Ben got it talking to. Um, no, I we did. are. We, I, I, I just feel like in these new injections, I, I just can't imagine anyone having a weight issue in the next 50 years. For what? Well, What's they fun? haven't approved oh. it yet for weight loss. They but have. They're about to. Wagovi. Wagovi is approved for weight loss. That's true. Listen, it, it, once they figure out a way to make it slightly cheaper, yes, that's correct. This will cure the crisis of obesity that people have been talking about and freaking out about for the last two decades, right? at least. And it's weird. Everybody's looking at it as like a designer cheating drug. And it's like, no, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing thing that happened. They figured something amazing out that's going to save countless lives. Those bastards. Talk, you know, the media talk, is we, terrible. Yeah. The, the, you know, they'll, they'll crush you. They'll just crush you. They'll, they'll, they, their whole job, right, media, right, is to scare the living shit out of you so that you tune back in and find out if the thing they told you to be scared about is still scary. Mm. And mm. so they keep this narrative going about like, oh, there could be side effects and it could be long-term. People don't know and all that. Shut the fuck up. Every doctor I've spoken to about it is like, it's amazing. It's a wonder drug. Yeah. Like, leave it alone. I um I had heard recently that it's beginning to be improved uh, approved for teenagers, you know, younger mm. and younger people. And I think about the fact like if a loving pediatrician at 12 years old, instead of trying to put me on cholesterol meds, was like, hey babe, we got this injection mm. and you're gonna be able to take your shirt off at um, you know, spring break. I would have been like, sign me up. If they were like, you're not going to get a TV show then, I would have been like, keep your TV show. I'll yeah. take the OZEMs. <laughs> yeah. I'll miss me on that trauma, babe. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, being large, you know, it's so paranoia-induced because you just think... Because people... It's sad. It's sad, but it's true that people see large people and it implies a weakness of character. If you're large, that means you cannot control your eating habits and you don't care about how you look, which is why you're large and therefore you are weak. It's so not true. People have thyroid issues. People have real issues. And, uh, and we're a mean, mean, snarky society. And here's this thing that is going to alleviate that as well. Trauma. Come yeah. on. And some people es- are- Especially are- for the kids, Josh. Like you, you pointed that out. Like, do you know, I mean, you know, I know there's nothing more traumatic than being an obese teen. Like it's, it's very, very different from sure. You can be fat as an adult and life is hard, but when like there's, there's nobody more judgmental in society than being in high school. So couldn't agree more that if you can get a quick injection, all of a sudden that, that fat fatty is nice and svelte getting good ass. Yeah. Changes a <laughs> teen's life. You and, know, I, I have a friend who is notoriously uh, non-emotional. Mm. You know, maybe on the spectrum a little bit, he kind of, everything's a joke. Everything is, you know, um, 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 what's the word? Uh, he, 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 he deflects. Everything's a deflection. But there's one thing that makes him cry. I asked him one day. I said, what makes you, do you ever cry? Does anything, you know, have you cried at the end of movies? And he's like, no. And I was like, well, does anything make you cry? And he said, fat babies. And I said, excuse me? And he said, fat babies. I said, what do you mean? He said, like, you know, two-year-olds that are ridiculously fat. He's like, that makes me cry. <laughs> so at, his, uh, at the rehearsal dinner for his wedding, I gave a speech. And I spoke about this. 
And on the back of the speech, I had a piece of paper covering a picture of a fat baby just so I could see him cry. And he did tear up a little bit. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> you, you're chaotic, I'm my a friend. Mean, I'm a mean. <laughs> you're wild. <laughs> you are an agent of chaos, yeah, David Grumholtz. A little, little bit. A little bit. Uh, that's, that's my uh, reputation. I know, I know it'll get my spectrum friend going on the happiest day of his life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah and look and and it must be said it goes without saying like all the bos body positivity stuff that's happened over the last decade all the empowerment that's that's incredible and if someone chooses to be bigger and enjoy food and living like god bless them but at least people have a choice now and i think the choice part is look, the important I have, part so i have i had the cancer i had thyroid cancer mm. they removed mm. my thyroid in total I gain weight looking at food. I mean, it, it's impossible for me to mm -hmm. keep weight off. It just doesn't happen. I swell up. I, I get swole up. Yeah. And uh, this is helping me tremendously. It's the only thing that works. So I can tell you this. With a thyroid issue like that, when you're severely hypo hypothyroid, and I am, no matter how much medication you take to, you know, um, Synthroid to, uh, to supplement your thyroid um, and, 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 and no matter how much you work out, it don't matter. Right. I did, I did a year of cardio and lost nothing. And I mean, I ate, I tried, it was impossible. The only thing that people with thyroid issues do to keep weight off is they gain muscle. They get really muscular and that kind of keeps weight off, but they're not losing, it keeps fat off, but they're not losing mm -hmm. weight. And, you know, I didn't want to be Joe Piscopo. You know what I mean? I didn't want to throw my career away going, God, Krumholtz, that funny guy, he decided to, like, become, like, super fit. Um, <laughs> so he's, he's, he's a bodybuilder. And you say that jokingly, but do you feel that that would limit you if you were overly fit for as an actor? Well, just the same way that being overly fat does. Sure. You know? um, so, yeah, I'd li I like being medium. Because you medium can fit works. into many, many different people's I mean, they skin. love they love chiseled skinny but at, at, at medium is the best i can do and and i'm 45 so now it's okay it's like oh yeah we don't expect you to be chiseled anymore you're 45 and you're a jew fair yeah because imagine had... being imagine being chiseled skinny josh chiseled i, I can't was even at one point. I, I... you were you were and so was i Chisel, I mean, chi like chiseled is in like fully shown at least when oh, i think about oh, it the like abs, fully the, i the meant abs. In the face i meant chiseled face Got it. No, I mean like taking like whatever yeah, it is, yeah, testosterone, yeah. and just right. getting loaded. I I can't even imagine what that feels like. Mm. Like, yeah. I mean, we have we've had a guy on, um, and he's you know he's more of like a reality star influencer, but <clears throat> he's getting into acting. His name's Harry Jousey, and he's in his mid twenties, and he's unapologetic about taking some injections and doing some things. And he's like totally like steroids though. Adonis. Oh yeah. My goodness gracious. And he's just like, but you know what? He's like, he's made his peace with it. He looks incredible. He's living a life that we won't ever. Mm. And I'm like, okay. Like I knew a 50 something year old actor who was taking a lot of steroids and he was, and I met him at my gym when I was working out. And he was the nastiest son of a bitch on earth. And then he Name stopped. Him. I can't. But he <laughs> he stopped doing them and like fell into a deep depression <laughs> and then became the most vulnerable, humble, sweetest. <laughs> Steroids a hell of a drug. Well, it's a hormone and hormones yeah. control everything. Yeah. So, um, so what uh, what is your... I mean, we can, I want to start with Oppenheimer. There's so many questions. Ben, mm. I know you're a massive fan of David. It, it, do you want yes. to start? Should I start? Please. This podcast is sponsored, brought to you by Squarespace. Look, Squarespace, it just makes making your website easy. And if you don't have a website, you're tripping. Recently, I was going to go to a restaurant. I'm like, let me check out like their menu or whatever. And this is not like a little hole in the wall mom and pop place. It was like a legit place. They had no website. And I'm like, I'm not going here. Like, I don't know. I, I was like worried about going into the restaurant. I'm like, if you don't have a website, like, is this like some, is this a front for like a crime family or something? I don't want to support that. Look, here's the best thing about Squarespace. They know you might not be like the most tech savvy or have like the most resource, but you'll have everything you need 
there, right? So whether you're doing like custom merch, you can easily sell custom merch and create a passive income stream that engages your audience and scales your brand with Squarespace. You can sell your products on an online store, whether you sell physical, digital, or service products, Squarespace has the tools you need to start selling online. And even if you want to do like email campaigns, you can drive sales and engage your audience with Squarespace email, email campaigns. I'm telling you, there are so many options. So go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash good guys to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. I'm telling you, it's Squarespace, baby. You, you, can, you can start. I would start with Oppenheimer and then we can go into to past works. But I did you guys work together? Like how much did you work together? We had one day. I guess day. I could start with that. One, you had one, one day scene. together. Yeah, there was one scene, yeah, where we're sitting around and I show up. It's like the scene of he's back. Yes. But not really. Um, and we're discussing, or I think it's like they realize they've, we, I, we're I don't know, starting I, the Trinity. I have seen the film. It's, it's long. I heard it's long. longer. Yeah, no, I've seen it. <laughs> I've, um, I've seen it three times. I love yeah, it. Yeah, but we, we hung out and I was, it was a pleasure to meet you because I've been a fan of yours for a while and, and, uh, and it was, and you're a lovely human being. So are you and thank you. And I, it was lovely of you, especially, you know, and I've had this moment with actors who I look up to and have a huge body of work and you ingratiated yourself to me mm. and so i just immediately felt i was like i'm in a safe place and you know amongst actors that's not always the case like well two things about that i one i am i live in a perpetual state of deep crushing embarrassment <laughs> so i am always flabbergasted when someone might be intimidated by me mm. because i'm like i loathe every breath i take um, so that's my starting point. And then once I figure out that people like me, uh, then I take advantage. No, <laughs> I, I just sort of at that point, at that point, I feel finally feel comfortable and feel loved and well liked. And, but when I meet someone who says nice things, like you said, my, I feel like I, I've got to disarm it because I really hate talking about myself. I really do. And it's a weird thing. I live in New Jersey. I have. New Jersey, a ton of great New Jersey friends who have never done, who have nothing to do with in this industry are as far away from it in their lives as possible, right? Like my two best friends are beer brewers. I'm in a Grateful Dead cover band and I made a bunch of older deadhead friends that are wonderful. And they, I get it. They want to talk to me about my thing because it's exciting. Right. right. It's exciting and it's rare. Oh, we get to talk. You know, we're talking, we ask, we're asking questions and I'm an open book. I'm happy to tell them everything at the same time. The, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but you ever like feel like, oh my God, I'm talking about myself so much. And I, and, and you're like, but how are you? And what's your job like? And what, what's it, how's it going? And then you see, oh, they don't like talking about their jobs. Like most no. people don't like talking about their jobs in that way. I don't like it either. I do it because. I get that people get enjoyment out of hearing how it's going. Is it cool to shoot a movie? You know, what is it like? I get it, but I the whole time I want to like die inside. I just don't love talking about it. I just don't. But do you find it's I'm my job? You know, like it's not that. I get why people. I used to be completely enamored with it, and now, sadly, I guess I'm jaded, and and I, and I, I it's just a job for me. You know, but I, I go for it, Ben. I, I just, I love that you live in New Jersey. I didn't know that. And I, I feel Jersey, like, yeah. I feel like Josh and I always talk about, so I'm, I'm from New York. Josh is from yeah. New York, moved to Los Angeles because he hates us. And <laughs> you are in New Jersey. Uh, mm. Did you live in LA for a portion? Do you think that you get less work, same amount of work living in New Jersey? Like, I feel like it's rare. No, I lived in LA for 15 years. Okay. Which is quite a long time if you think about it. And uh, moved back to New Jersey about nine and or to the East coast. I'm from Queens, but I moved back to, we will move to New Jersey nine and a half years ago. My wife, we had a child and, and now we've had, we have another child. And, um, and, uh, yeah, I, I, I felt like I paid my dues and I felt like being New Yorky on New Yorky type actor that I would be okay. I left in the night, the late nineties or early two thousands when there was no tax credit in New York. 
and it really dried up. Like in the early 90s, I was working quite consistently out of New York. And then suddenly it just, everyone was providing, ta Toronto started providing tax credits. Right. And everything shooting in Toronto suddenly for New York. Mm. And I thought, well, you know, I'm going to have to go out to LA at some point anyway. And I'd been there to do like a guest card on some sitcom. And so I was like, you know, it's time I move there. And I did. And I stayed way longer than I ever thought I would or possibly, arguably should have. Um, and, and now I'm, I'm home again and it's really nice. And it, it, and the, the New York scene is its own scene and its own industry in a way. And it's been lovely to me and I'm, I'm thrilled about it. But that's, so. that is the sign of someone successful when they don't <laughs> have to live that close to the business, like where you're just, but it's also h hilarious because like recently I got a, I had an audition for the new Suits reboot Suits. L.A. Suits, Los Angeles. Mm. You didn't shot, tell me that. <clears throat> Fantastic. To, to be shot Love in Van, to be shot in Vancouver, and like oh, whenever there's a New York show, they'll be like, "Oh, this is gonna be something, something New York." Shot in Montreal and or Toronto. It's right. just like mm -hmm. the. So I'll tell you, you're not so gonna work much there. Shoots in Vancouver specifically. It's oh, crazy. I, spent, I lived there for a year. Yeah, it's crazy. When I was there, the last time I was there, I was shooting like a week on the twi the new t Twilight Zone. Mm. And I asked the driver, I was like, so how many productions are, and this was right before the pandemic. I said, how many productions are going right now? And she said, 47. Yeah. Wow. 47 productions. in. that's way more than anywhere else I would, even LA. 47? Oh, it's about, I love shooting up there. I do. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. The I had a bad experience 20 years ago because they had yet to build up the town. It was still sort of a smaller city. And the money that filming has brought to that town is, has been uh, transformative for that city. It's, it's now a massive city with like amazing everything yeah. to it. And uh, so I hadn't been back in 20 years until I went and shot The Twilight Zone. I was blown away. I couldn't believe it was like, it's a totally different place. And I had a blast. So. It's, it's not bad. It's not bad at all. I, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask... Because I really want to hear sort of the beginning of the Oppenheimer story for you. Mm -hmm. But I, I also feel like, you know, the reason why I feel like you and I gravitated towards each other on set and like, I'm always looking for those guys. And what I mean is one of the guys on set, a guy who chooses to live in New Jersey, because hmm. I feel amongst actors, <clears throat> there can be a lot of pretension mm. an air of like it's rarely usually with like the really famous but mm. amongst like the quasi famous there's just like there can be this actory energy that really doesn't interest me like mm. i really like people who have who act like they're blue collar even if they have a white collar job mm. and um well, and i always say when i like if i do a if i do a, a a gig and there's an actor or an actress who we're all in a group and they see something wild I've been around, David, so have you. I've been around people who've said wild shit, like hippy dippy, weird, fanciful things, unacceptable, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that if it was your boy and you're kicking it in Montclair, you'd go, Ralph, what the fuck? Right. You'd be like, what'd you just say? And when no one corrects them, I go, this isn't gonna be fun. Well, here's, the, here's, the, here's what I've realized, uh, <laughs> or here's what I've learned from my, from experience. One, there's all kinds of crazy and actor crazy is a specific crazy. <laughs> yeah. A very, it's punching. It's like punch. It's like being a gambler, right? Cause acting is sort of like living a gambling lifestyle, right? You're, you're waiting for your cards to drop and to play them right and all that. And a lot of times you just got to wait and some yeah. big waiting game and you go crazy and you, you just mostly go, you lose fucking go crazy. And then it happens. And then you're like paranoid that you're not good and you're your own product and it's and you know it's it can be crazy making so actor crazy very, very is a very specific thing. I've also learned that the business uh, Hollywood is made up fifty 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 percent absolute upward failing or failing upward talentless <laughs> bastard scumbags yeah. and fifty percent earnest nerds. Which one am I? You're an earnest nerd. Okay, good, good. And, good, I, and good. I would hope I am too. <laughs> but, but, and in that way, actors are the same. The actors, actors are some of the worst people I've ever met in my <laughs> life, but also the best. And there's no in between. Yes. So if half of them That's... are the most wonderful people and half of them are horrible. 
and there's you never meet like an actor who's kind of nice or who's kind of a dick. They're always just full on dicks or the full on. And and here's the sad part. Here's the new realization I've come to. And this is the unfair part. Is that sometimes the nerds become the scumbags. Mm. But the scumbags mm. never become nerds. Whoa. Whoa, that's good. Am I wrong? You're a hundred percent right. Yeah, the right, nerds right. inherit the earth, and it becomes mm -hmm. yeah. They, it's Stockholm. They they fall in love with their captors, and mm -hmm. then they become them. Yeah. What? So, will you tell me the beginnings of like your audition for Oppenheimer? I mean, I love that story. I know yeah. you've told it on a pod before, but mm -hmm. it's so damn good. I'm gonna ask you to tell yeah, it again. Yeah, no, just uh, I flew in. So you sent a tape first, or I sent the tape that I think we all sent. Right, we all had that monologue about. Black the black holes. holes. I two think page, that was yeah. for everybody. All if you were reading for a scientist, it was going to be that monologue. From there, the callback is the character, mm. and that's what happened. I did two tapes. The first one about the black hole, and then the second one was okay. This is the character, and at that point, it's two scenes, and you don't know in you don't really you can kind of try to gleam in what context your character exists in the film from the material, but it's not a lot of material. And you think, okay, maybe this is, this is it. You know, this is, these two scenes are it. And, and I'm, I'll take two scenes. I'll take a half a scene in a sure. Chris Nolan movie. I'll take a quarter scene. Uh, so yeah, there's no, I'm not like above that at all. I'm like, yeah, shit, this is amazing. And you never get the script, never get the script. And then, you know, I got, I, so then I, they said, you, can you come to LA? And I said, sure. I'll come to LA. And I went, and uh, the weird thing was, was when I got there, John Papsidera, the casting director, said, you're the only one here for this. Whoa. And I thought, well, shit. That's scary as hell. But I've been there before, luckily. I've been in that position before, and I was like, well, you know, fuck it. I'm just going to go in and crush this thing the best I can, and, 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 and who knows? You know, who knows? Now, I had met Chris Nolan, years and years prior uh, while I was shooting Numbers and he was a fan of Numbers and he told me and I'm a fan of your show and I was like holy crap <laughs> he and ingests a lot he watches a lot he of watches stuff a lot right of stuff yeah and then I was like so so there was that confidence going into the room with him where I was like oh he knows who I am and and this is not you know I'm here for a reason he's he's been a fan of some something I've done mm. So that made me feel confident. And then he gave me three takes of both scenes. So three takes each, both scenes. So I'm in there quite some time. Three takes is a lot. You usually do two, right? Yeah. You do one, he gives you notes, you do two, maybe you do three. And at the end of the third, he said, uh, can you do one more? And I said, sure. He goes, do it like you're driving home from this audition thinking I should have done it that way. Whoa. And wow. Which is a smackdown note, right? Which is a, a, you know, it's the mallet to the top of the head. It's just plunking you into the ground. Because he's saying that it's not so right. So scary. No, I don't think so. What's I think, he saying? I think he wanted to test my mettle as a person on set. Like, how am I going to be on set? It, give me, give him the most brutal direction I can give him. Mm. And see if he, like, gets w pissed about wilt. it. Wilt. Or if he like handles it. And what I did was I so it was so crazy. I started laughing and I said, ah, you know, driving home, it'll happen in the elevator on the way. And he was like, okay. And that, I think I didn't have to do that fourth take. I think he wanted to see that moment of me being like, no, I'm okay. Like that, that doesn't phase me. But of course it did. <laughs> and when I left, I thought I'd blown the whole thing. And I got really drunk afterwards. And, uh, it was, it, I, I just thought, well, you know, you're just the biggest audition of your career. And it hurt. And uh, and then I got it. <laughs> like an hour later, right? <laughs> like, like about two hours later, yeah. I found out that I got it. And then I got to read the script. And I was like, holy shit, dude. This guy gave me like a bigger part than I expected. And it was like, oh, this guy kind of, Chris Nolan kind of saved me. Mm. And I needed saving at that moment. I really did. And I and How so? I had been dropped by my agency a few months prior. No way. Yeah. After eight years with them. Wow. They dropped me. The pandemic happened. I didn't work for 16 months straight. They were not happy with the amount of money I made when I finally did work after that 16-month stretch. Uh, 
mind you, 11 months of that wasn't my fault. Sure. <laughs> you know, at least there was a pandemic. The business shut down. Uh, but yeah, I didn't make enough money in that remaining seven months. And they said, listen, you know, we, we don't, we can't do this anymore. And they dropped me and I was devastated. And I thought, well, that's how it ends. I, I am get, and this is how it ends. I just get dropped and kicked out of the business. And then luckily, like a week later, I found an even a more amazing agent than ever. And she was like, oh no, we're going to like stick it up their asses. Yeah. You know, like in, in um, major league when uh, Charlie Sheen, thinks he's cut by the team. He's wrong, but he thinks he is, and he mm. goes in and he yells at the manager, and he's like, I'm going to come back here and shove it right up your ass. That's kind of was like, oh, I'm, we've got to do that now. We've got to, sh you know, get crazy. And uh, Oppenheimer was one of two jobs that I got that were that for me, where Ugh. it was just like revenge in a way. Wow. Which is sick, but I was pissed that I got dropped and sad. I was scared, you know, super scared. Um, what, so, yeah, what and, does that week lo look like before uh, you get the brutal. new agent? Is it like, I'm going to take, brutal. I'm going to take the Grateful Dead cover band on tour? No, like, in fact, it's funny <laughs> you bring that up because what happened was I had a, uh, I had a Grateful Dead cover show two days after I found out I got dropped. Oh, you must've been and, really in it. And I have a lovely friend named Ray Longchamp, who's a brilliant musician and I'm in his band, wonderful person, brilliant man. And he's a little bit of a, um, how, how do I put this? He's... He's a little bit of a kook mm -hmm. and uh, and 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 a little uh, and very funny, but haphazardly funny sometimes, meaning he doesn't know he's being funny when he and I went up to him and, you know, again, someone who has no idea about what goes on in the industry. And he said, hey, how you doing? And I show up to the gig and he goes, hey, how you doing, Dave? And I go, I'm not doing too well. And he goes, why? And mind you, this is a Sunday in New Jersey. And I go, uh, my agent dropped me a couple days ago. And no, I didn't say a couple days ago. I said my agent dropped me. And he said, uh, you, your agent dropped you off at this gig? I said, yeah, it's Sunday. <laughs> yeah. And my agent drove me to the gig in New Jersey. No, my agent <laughs> yeah. dropped me, meaning like my agent quit. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, my agent drives yeah. Uber in Red Bank. Uh, <laughs> and in that moment, you know, I was able to, that's the first bit of laughter I got out of it. Isn't that funny? I thought, all right. That's um, unbelievable. Yeah, your agent dropped you off here? Um, but no, um, it rocked me, man. It hurt terribly. I cried. Oh. I cried. I cried oh. on the phone with her. I would too. I was crying. Uh, <laughs> I would too. It was intense, man. Wow. These how, it was an how, intense moment. People, people are so stupid. Like these agencies are so stupid. And well, they have bottom uh, lines, I, you know. And no, and no, I, I, you would I think know that it's... loyalty and belief in the actor would trump the bottom line, and in this mm. case, it just didn't. Which but is what such money, a bummer. But what, but what money are they spending? So, like, maybe we talk about <laughs> this for a second because I find this very interesting. Like, we're we're repped again, not not an actor at all, but we do digital gigs, right? So we're right. We're we're repped by the same. Maybe it's William Mars or whoever you were with. And mm. I never understood. Sure, you need to put in time, right, to get this person something. But that agent is being paid to work not just on you, I would assume, right? It's an undedicated right. agent, usually. There's a whole book, and to wait, it's kind of like somebody playing slots. You're gonna pull it a hundred times, a hundred and first, you're, you're gonna get it. You just put, they just put in 16 months, plus a pandemic. I don't know, all, all I'm saying is- Well, I think the first, they, I'll say this, the first like seven agents I had in my career over the course of the first 21, 22 years, God bless them all, but they were all leaning toward that other 50% that I mentioned yeah, before, that, yeah, that non, yeah, non sure. nerdy. I don't want to use the word again. Fair enough. And Scum. I knew it, but I had to get through them, you know, to yeah, find they can be the useful, nerd. Yeah, useful. And then I found the nerd who lived and breathed it. But ultimately, I think, and, and genuinely is a really good person and a good agent, an amazing agent. But ultimately, I think half of being with a big agency is about doing as much as you possibly can to impress the agencies and, and the agency and the other agents and less about impressing and helping and building a career. The thing is with that agent, we were building and mm. that's why it came as such a shock um, that they gave up on the building, you know, that, you know, um, and that was a, you know, shocking because then you go, well, should I give up on my, you know, should I just take money? Should I just do like, what should I be doing? Like, should I just do anything for money at this point? Like, 
What's your dream money gig? Like sellout money gig? Oh, like, Marvel movie for sure. That's your dream sellout gig. 100%. That's just my dream. Period. Gig. Yeah. No. That's no. my. I mean, someone consider here that about a sellout. A Hallmark I don't movie. consider it a sellout. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know. Uh, oh, absolutely. Uh, I'm. I grew up a big comic book fan, so uh, Marvel comics specifically. So. Oh. But yeah, I mean, it, it happened, and and apologies were sent, and sadness went down. And it was madness, and I ended up with a woman that I absolutely love, who represents the crap out of me, and gets it, and works really hard, and it all ended up being for the best, you know. But uh, it always yeah, is, it, isn't it? It's a scary it always business. is for the best. Look, it's a business, and it's a scary bit. It's a very scary business. Speaking but, but of even, scary, but even oh, to the people ahead. that listen to our podcast that aren't actors, it's the same. It's the same as being fired from a job. Right. Mm -hmm. Everybody's been fired. Right. You're you're right. very upset in the moment. You're like, oh, my God, if I wasn't good enough for this, how am I going to be good enough for anybody? And then you get the next job and it's even better. And it puts well, you on a different But there is a difference path, in this. You know? There is one difference in the sense that the people who employ you don't have your entire life in their hands. Like there's some you can kind of, you know, you can go find the next job. Right. You found that job. Whereas agents have your life in their hands. You don't even know what they're working on. They don't tell you. They refuse to do they, tell you. And you don't do want to bother do them. They still, and then you don't want to bother them. Do they still, them. though, Josh? Yes. Do, do you oh, think absolutely. that they still? If, there, and you don't want to bother with, them. You, you Like, yeah. there's a way to bother them, which is, hey, I know someone who's producing this specific project. Yeah. Uh, is there anything in there for me? But they, hey, what's going on? Hey, agent, uh, what's uh? So is anything going on? They hate that. They right. hate that because... Of course there's things going on, but they're afraid to tell you because then you get really high expectations and then get disappointed if they don't happen, which is likely the, 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 the result, you know, most of the time is that, it, you know, a successful career in, in, in any industry, but in Hollywood is a mountain of disappointments next to a handful of successes, right? you know, and um, so, you know, they don't like that question. I get it. I get why they don't. Um, but they do ultimately, and, and a lot of them don't like the pressure of having your life in their hands. And when you have kids or you get married, they have your family's life in their hands. Mm -hmm. And that's heavy responsibility. Um, and yeah, it's hard because you don't, you cannot make the call. I can't call. Maybe if I knew a friend, I can sort of go, hey, I heard there's a part in your movie. And, uh, and I've done that. But you know, for the most part, you got to just hope and pray that they're, you know, convincing someone on your behalf. It's a weird thing, right? So in the early, when, when Hollywood began, there were talent scouts. There weren't actors in LA. There right. weren't a lot. It was just, they happened to start in LA. It wasn't like they went to a place where actors were. They just went to a place where it was sunny and easy to shoot. And so the Hollywood talent scouts became a thing. People who would go around the country and find talented people. And then what ended up happening was Hollywood became a popular thing. Movies blew up. By the 19, early 1940s, late 30s, L.A. was populated with actors suddenly who had decided themselves to be intrepid and come out here. And the scouts must have gotten together and been like, shit, we're not going to be, like, they're, they're not going to need talent scouts anymore. Right. I know what we can do. We form an agency and we decide what happens and we, we're, the, we're the conduit. And at that point, you know, you jump the shark a little bit on how the industry works, but they defined how the industry works in that moment. And you need these middlemen. They're middlemen, you know. Um, and some of them are great. And, and some of them are absolutely amazing. It's just like actors. Some of them are really crushing it and want their... They, the, the interesting thing is, is the power dynamic shifts, right? Because starting out, you really need them. And in theory, in success... You don't need them anymore, but if they're great, you trust their instinct. You trust their take on things, the way mm -hmm. that they ingest what you're going to do, the next product, project, their insight, their ability in which to like foresee issues coming down the road. Because you don't need them to necessarily make calls anymore because the calls are coming in. But I think... Um, well, then their instinct has to be on you. Yeah. You know, what do they see in you? You know, like, yeah, there's projects out there, but what do, do they see what you see in yourself? Do they see your potential? Yeah. And, um, it took me 20 years to convince most of my first few agents of, that I could do certain things that, that would surprise people. You know, they'll put you in a box real quick. And mm -hmm. that's the, that's the 
straight way out of this business because then people just go, oh, we know what that guy does. We don't, he's done it already. We don't want to see that guy do, we want that thing, but we don't want that guy to do it because he's done it in everything already. Right. And, uh, and so I, you know, my whole thing was always like, how do I differentiate? How do I surprise people? And the hardest part is when your own representation doesn't believe that you can do that. Oh, don't you just love that? Oh, what, man. what uh, I remember you talked about how your first couple of days shooting on Oppenheimer, you were worried that maybe you weren't approaching the character the right way. No, I, I wasn't until <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't worried at all about that until we started shooting. Yeah. And uh, Chris wasn't thrilled with what I was doing. I thought this is what I did in the audition and like, <laughs> this is what I, you know, like I thought we, I thought we it was agreed. a tough moment because, like, you know, look, no director is above giving you a note, and he gives amazing notes that are that have a ton of brevity and specificity. And I love taking direction. I need direction. I'm scared, you know, on a set. I don't know what I'm doing. I have no idea what the f I'm doing most of the time. And but you do it, and you go, okay, I know what I did just now. And Chris gave me notes that begged for the response. That's what I did. I just did that. But you can't say that to Chris Nolan. You know, he's Chris <laughs> Nolan. A lesser director, I might have, you know, I might have said, dude, I, that's what I did. Right. And gotten to mm. that sort of argument. But I wasn't going to do that with Chris at all. Like, I was just like, okay, how do I make it ob more, a little more obvious that I'm doing what I'm doing? Do you think that's what he was asking I from you? So. Like turn it up I think he slightly? Just, he wanted me to turn it up slightly and also simplify it at the ah. same time. You know, like maybe I was trying too hard. Maybe there was too much consternation or something. And, you know, in that moment, you just have to know as an actor, he is right. Chris is right. Why? Because he's a pro and he's done this a million times. And in Chris's specific case, he's a genius. Yeah. And you go, oh, I'm going to, I'm not. So I should shut the, I should shut my ego down and all that in this moment and just try to get through this and do exactly what he wants. So we did the first scene and he comes up to me afterwards with the same sort of, uh, bonk, you know, mallet for my head. And he just goes, uh, 14 takes, huh? And I'm going, well, shit, you know, first scene. <laughs> I, yeah, I've 14 takes in my close up. I know I'm not thrilled, I, <laughs> we, but we found it. Didn't we? We found it. You were happy. Yeah. And he was like, yeah, I'm happy. And I was like, oh, shit, <laughs> well, you're not that happy. <laughs> oh, I was like, well, shit. So then we did the next um, scene, and I did nine takes of my close-up, which is also not great, because he does like three or four right. you know, at the most. And he comes up to me, he goes, nine takes. It's better than 14, which is what you did the first time. I said, holy <laughs> shit. But man. who's keeping and track? Then I realized, yeah, and then I realized, oh, this is this is the the bit. Like, this is a bit. Yes. You know, make Crumb hold shit his pants. That's so the British. Bit. It's so, so British clean, and so like, dry. Yeah, and I deserve it. Dry as the desert. You know, and I deserve it. And I played, <laughs> and I thought it was all funny. But it made it so that when I did one of my last scenes, which is the scene with uh, with Jason Clark, where I'm being, I'm giving that little speech about, you know, how amazing um, Oppenheimer is and how ridiculous their pursuit of charges or, or you know them trying to rob him of se his security clearances um i showed up with a like a vengeance mm. a vendetta i was just like oh no we're not doing any more than like two takes today like i'm gonna rock this thing and did that happen it did i <gasps> two came takes? In, i knew it backwards and forwards and i was like i'm not fucking this up i'm leaving here feeling great and that was my goal was just to impress chris because by that point, I was so enamored with Chris uh, that I was just like, man, all I want to do is make this guy, like, leave no doubt in his mind that he made the right choice with me. I mean, it's an intimidating cast to be a part of mm. and to be given kind of a substantial role in. You know, there was a bit of, like, a why me? And yeah. Am I wor I'm not worthy, you know, the whole time. And then it wasn't going great. I was doing 14 takes and 9 takes, and, and I thought, oh, it's, I'm not worthy. So that whole scene was about me just showing up and going, no, I'm going to kick this scene's ass. Well, since you've told these incredible stories about Chris and your experience, there's I love one Chris. There, I love, uh, I love it, Chris. Beyond an honor to work for one of the the true genius. And greats. he's a funny guy. He's a mensch. He's, he's a sweetheart. Awesome. I, he's a I sweetheart. love Chris. I don't even know Chris. We <laughs> all love Chris, Chris. Christopher Nolan is go Chris. The ideal for me. 
and not best. for everyone, I imagine, but for me, yeah. I, I, there's one story I've wanted to tell, but I, I haven't. But I guess why, why not? Right? We're all okay. here now. It might as well. Um, I, um, <clears throat> I'll never forget that there was, um, you know, the scene during the Trinity test, and, um, you know, it's me and Killian, and it's, it's kind of this great moment that I get to share with him during this scene, and, and historically. Oppenheimer gives his famous line um, from the Bhagavad Gita, mm. you know, um, now I am death, the destroyer of worlds. Right. And then following that, my character, Kenneth Bainbridge, who's a real scientist, said, well, I guess now we're all sons of bitches. Mm. And I was like, it's a pretty good line. Yeah. I go, I mean, it's not in the script, but it's a good line. Mm. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're shooting. <laughs> And we're in between things, and I go, um, you know, Chris, there's this, there's a line, and I'm like, you know, it's historical, right? Like, I'm like, this is like a well, you know, documented line. So I'm like, he's gonna love this, you know, you know, Johnny doing his homework over here, he's gonna be so thankful. So I go, you know, there is this line that that Kenneth Bainbridge said after after Oppenheimer, and he looks at me and he kind of looks up and goes, "Oh, everyone's doing their research." And he walks away. <laughs> I was like, yes, sir. Gotcha. All yeah. right. I'll be here quietly. <laughs> I'll tell so. you a really funny story um, that I haven't told. Um, it's like my second day of shooting. It's the scene where you first see me, where I walk in and uh, to, to his lecture in Dutch. He's yes. doing, And I'm amazed that he, he's doing it in Dutch. I think I'm going to have to translate it for the guy sitting next to me. But it turns out he's doing it in Dutch and I need a translation. The actor, <laughs> the actor in that I speak to, it's like he has two words mm. in in it, which is just like I'm o no, I'm okay. Or I said, you, you know, let me know if you need a translation. And he says, no, I'm okay. Or I say something like, I don't remember what his words, but he had two words mm. in the whole movie. Sweet young actor who happened to be actually Dutch, and. <laughs> We get to the set and he tells, he sees Killian do, we do a rehearsal and he sees Killian do it and he goes up to Chris and he goes, his Dutch isn't great. <laughs> and Chris goes, well, he's, he's playing an American doing a Dutch, so it's okay if his Dutch accent is slightly off. So then the, the kid sat back down and was kind of put out and I'm sitting next to him and, and I call him a kid. He wasn't a kid. He's a grown man, but younger than me. <laughs> And uh, we roll on the first take, and he starts improvising. No. Yeah. No. Like, full on. So Chris cuts and comes over and goes, uh, did, did you say extra words? And he said, well, yeah. yeah. And Chris said, oh, you know, I don't think we need to do that. I think just say it as written, and we'll be all right. So then uh, we do a second take, and the kid ad-libs again but says less. But still ad libs. They're like, <laughs> so Chris cuts again. And poor Chris, in the nicest way possible, just walked over and said, uh, Did you uh, did you say extra words again? And he said, Well, yeah, I did. Because I think it. And uh, Chris said, Just, you know, I write the lines. I, I'm, I write the lines. Yes. And good for him. I mean, <laughs> you know, like, just so you know, this is not, I didn't give you license to improv. And just just say the lines. Like I know they're Ugh. not like you don't have a ton of stuff, but like I write the lines, man. So if you're if if I want to give you more, I'll give you more. Um, and but I thought, wow, the balls on that guy. Good for him. What I love is you that know? since that was shot two years ago, he spent two years rationalizing. Oh, I'm neurotic. <laughs> it wasn't as bad as I thought yeah. it was. <laughs> and David Crumholtz is here to tell you it was that bad. It wasn't that bad. It was just like, <laughs> uh, now I feel bad. See, now <laughs> I feel bad. Oh, good. Now I feel that, bad. No, no, no you just, that he doesn't bad. listen. You, just like... you said that he's Dutch. He doesn't listen. <laughs> yeah, he's not yeah, listening yeah. to us. It was we just have a like... fan in Pakistan. We don't have any Dutch fans, I don't think. <laughs> Look, man. Man, if you got to take your shot while you can, and the kid took a shot, and it didn't work out for him, but he should be proud of himself. Ah, oh, I get it. Just never do that again. So, yeah. <laughs> so what is it? It's very. Oh, go, Josh. No, please. After you, Ben. I was going to say it's completely different from Oppenheimer, but I would be remiss not to talk, if you're comfortable, a little bit about Sausage Party, as mm. it happens to be. It, 
one of one of my favorite movies. I like if I want to laugh, I'm watching Sausage Party, mm-hmm. and Lavash in particular is just such a wonderful character. Mm. Especially is like all it's like our humor on on Good Guys is just so that like deep Jewishy humor, and it just mm. like is such like a I, 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 just like getting in your head like to do a role like that. Like how much how much fun did you have doing that? It was a ridiculous amount of fun. I'll say this. So it took seven <laughs> years. It took seven years to get that movie made. Meaning, wow. not meaning it didn't take seven years to make the movie. It took seven years for someone to want to make the movie. And so in the in the inter in those seven years, we did like three or four read throughs, table reads for the industry for different studios. Um, like once every year and a half, we would be like, "Oh, there's a we're going to do another sausage party reading." And it would improve every time. Like, it was crazy funny and one of the funniest scripts I've ever read. You know, Ari Shafir and and, uh, and and Kyle Hunter. Just one of the funniest scripts I've ever read from the first time. But it kept getting funnier. And it's a credit to, to Seth and Evan. They were just like, this is great. And we're not going to give up on this. They could have given up on that movie so easily. There was every reason to not keep pursuing it other than the script was so damn funny and so brilliant. And, but, you know, studios are always looking for a reason to say no. And the one thing they don't want to do do is go into uncharted territory. So the, the uncharted territory there being like, can we make a really sort of dirty R rated animated comedy spend the money you would spend on an animated movie will this you know work Mm. like will we make money on this thing eventually and to to the credit of of kyle and and ariel and and ari and and uh and uh you know um seth and evan they just didn't stop fighting they didn't and the way they fought was they just kept making it better and better i played lavash from the very first table read and it was clear, like, there's not going to be another Lavash. Like, I had so much fun with it, and they liked what I was doing. But over the many uh, table reads, there were lots of different actors that played the different roles in the movie. Sure. Um, but I kept in there, and, and it was like, hey, if this ever gets made, don't, like, replace me with a name. Yeah. You know, like, just hire me. I will do Lavash. I'm Lavash. That's it. And they <laughs> did. You know, they were like, all right, we're making it. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, we're, we're, we're making it? He's like, yeah, Sony bought it. I was like, holy crap. And I was like, wow, am I still Lavash? Yeah. No, or yeah. am I like, <laughs> pe- am I peanut, am I peanut number two? Right. And they were like, no, you're totally Lavash. I was like, oh, that's amazing. I had so much fun. Those guys are my buddies. I've known them for a really long and time. And you're in like the Apatow camp. You've done a lot with them. Super bad. Yeah. And, yeah. Those and guys are, up. so Seth and I met on Freaks and Geeks. I've known him for 26 years. He's one of my dearest friends in the world. So, and Evan Goldberg too. And so we, you know, when you work with friends, it's just so much easier. There's a, there's, 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 you know, a shorthand and. Um, there's none of that sort of shotgun wedding, strange bedfellows thing where you have to get mm. to know somebody and, and, you know, you spend half the movie getting to know them and then, and then you have chemistry, you know, in this case it was just easy and they knew what I was capable of. And we did a lot of crazy stuff in the, you know, cause it's a cartoon and it's, mm. in a, you know, you roll out of bed into a voiceover booth and you do it. Um, we, and a lot of it made the movie and a lot of it didn't. Uh, because some of it was so disgusting and wild and ridiculous and us just throwing (laughs) spaghetti at the wall to see what stuck. And what's great about the tone of that film is you can throw a lot of spaghetti yeah, and a lot of it will stick and they let us do it. You know, can I, I want to, I'm going to prepare you for our final segment and Mm -hmm. give you a second to think. And then I have one more question about your incredible filmography. Um, we do a, what are you nuts moment of the week? What are you nuts? What are you nuts? What are you nuts? I get it. Except, guy, yep. Great, brilliant actor. Tony that. Award so winning sharp. actor. That, He's that in. Me a split second to figure that out. So yeah. it's your gripe with people, places, or things, anything that's currently grinding wow. your gear, oh, big or small. But uh, we'll give you time to think about it, and Ben and I will go first. My last question is, 10 Things I Hate About You is one of, it. it I just think it has lasted um, uh, the test of time, and it's such a fascinating picture because you have like, these comedy geniuses in Larry Miller and you and like 
hysterical people, and and then you have like Julia Stiles and Joe Levitt, like these these great great talents, and then you've got Heath Ledger. Mm. Like, what was that experience like? Is there anything that sticks out for you? I, oh man, I, I loved Heath very much. We became very close. So if there's anything that sticks out, it's that he's not here. Yeah, you know that. As I get older, it gets worse in a weird way, because like I get to get older. You know, I'm f- mm. going to be 46 mm-hmm. in a couple, 46 in a couple months. He was 29, and it's mind blowing to me, and it never gets less mind blowing. In fact, it becomes more and more mind blowing. And the weird thing is, we had so much fun, and there's so many stories from that movie, and some of them I remember, and some of them I don't. But the one thing that I just it's a weird thing, you know, when I think about 10 Things I Hate About You, I think about how one of my dearest friends who's amazing in that movie died, you know, and it's hard. It's a hard thing. It's yeah. really, it's not getting any easier. It's getting harder. He was a wonderful human being who would have been the life of every party, and he smiled bright, and he he was just a wonderful guy who did not want to die. And that's hard. It's hard that he did, you know, really hard. So, yeah. yeah. One of the yeah. greats. Not to bring it down, yeah. but yeah. No, man, it's beautiful. Yeah, that's, that's, it's, uh, I love them. I love him. He was wonderful. We, we made, we were close friends and it just sucks. It yeah. sucks. You know, I knew there was, there were issues. I stayed out of them. I wish I maybe had been smart enough, strong enough, experienced enough to dip my toe in that water and say, hey, do you need a, a? Do you need help? You know, so hard. And I kind of did, and I kind of didn't. And I, you know, there, there's regret there, and there's there's sadness, but it is what it is. You know, and he happened to give one of the most intense, electrifying, immersed performances in the history of cinema before he died, and I'm really glad that happened. With Chris. With what? With Chris. With Chris. Yeah. With so Chris good. Nolan, yeah. yeah. Incredible. So good. Um. Oh, and then last, last question, uh, because we're going to have the great Jack Quaid in next. I got to ask you about this Oppenhomies. I love it, the, the Jack Quaid. I love it, the, the Jack Quaid. The Jack Quaid is a good person. This guy. But the Oppenhomies group chat, which has now become folklore, mm. there's mm. mythology, there's articles written. I feel like it's a little <laughs> much. My phone's constantly blowing up. It was mm. a nice thing when it started. It started about groceries when we were shooting in New mm. Mexico. Right. And now these people, you know, streams of thought. With the, does no one have a job? What's going on? Wow. <laughs> That's harsh, Josh. I'm sorry. But first of all, now, see, you've Don't opened lie. a can of worms. <laughs> you said Josh, you too. Josh quit the chat. <gasps> and you can see when someone quits the chat. You know, it's a Josh, Josh Peck has left the group. I, I can explain. And I was like, and then he came up with some bullshit excuse that he pushed the wrong button or something. Bullshit. I, no, I didn't. It all was right. very earnest, my, my choice. Yes. Why look, you do you realize you can mute <laughs> but it still lights the whole up. Thing. But it still lights up. Well, I don't like the little red ball. Oh, Josh. Dear. Well that's Josh, OCD. Josh, that's you, OCD. You should have like, muted. You should have muted. You should have muted. Trust me, I'm back on it's muted. Um <laughs> oh, oh, you've been re oh you've been re added? I We we yeah, we added him back. Yeah. My earnest truth. And I feel safe here sharing it with you boys. <laughs> it was we were on the group chat, it's firing, blah 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 blah. I was so blessed to be in the movie, and I, like about 10 of our other compatriots, Mm. could have easily, perhaps, through no fault of just like a necessary editing need, been cut out of the movie. You feel, I'm going to cut you up, you feel that you were unworthy of being an Oppenheimie, don't you? I felt that when the film ended, and it was such a fabulous experience, that until I saw it, I was, it was it like triggered a fear in me every time. Yeah, I felt undeserving. That's sad, man. And it wasn't until I saw the movie that I felt comfortable enough Josh, to be back on. Well, first of all, they couldn't have cut you. You pushed the fucking button. But secondly, uh, uh, you uh, know, uh, what uh, can you do? Uh, <laughs> but uh, but uh, secondly, you're a wonderful uh, part of the, the whole experience. Thank and, you. Uh, An you honor. Know, yeah, yeah. Um, ben, you want to start us off with your Woody you Nuts? Yeah, sure. Um, so... Uh, Everybody loves Taylor Swift. Mm. I love Taylor Swift. Anybody Mm. that says that they don't love Taylor Swift, honestly, is a what are you nuts? Because she's a fantastic, just uh, lyricist. Uh, The the way that she sells at arenas, it's unbelievable. That said, I don't know if you guys saw this. Have you seen the way that Taylor Swift holds a pen? 
<laughs> no. No. Google it but, so you guys can look at it while I describe it, and everybody at home needs to look this up too. I I'm on it. I, I'm on it. I saw a very disturbing image of the way that Taylor Swift holds a pen. Can I say that I hold pens weird? Do you hold it so, between these two fingers? Can you see these? Uh, yeah. Ah. Uh, let me. See. I can't she, really see that. Uh, she hold. She holds it in the middle. You know, you make this yeah, the V. That's, that is exactly what I do, and my daughter that, does it too. It's genetic. Wow. Oh, I don't do it like that. Oh no, we're like looking that. at a picture. No, I've never strange. seen yeah. anything like this Actually, in my life. Wait a second. Give me a pen, or I'll just use this straw because I don't. Now I don't remember what I do. So I kind of do that. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Okay. Do so then the, do you see that? So then the so then the two of you. What are you nuts? How do you hold a pen like <laughs> well, that? Well, what's weird is my daughter does it, so it must be genetic. I don't know. It's 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 the way I feel comfortable writing. I can't even I can't even envision how it sits on this. I finger. can't envision that. I can't I can't do. I think this is so uncomfortable and weird. How dare you? See, wow, wow, this is humanity. What, Isn't this what are you unbelievable? Nuts? Isn't there this goes, unbelievable? There Taylor goes Swift, show. what are you nuts? Oh, we're, about, you nuts? <laughs> we're about to get sunk in the comments by the army. Yeah, thank yeah, you, the Ben. Coming after um, I, by the uh, way, as long as the army listens, we're good. Yeah, right. Biggest we'll podcast about, in the world by tomorrow. We, we love Taylor here. Um, my what are you nuts moment is, you know, I got the YouTube TV, mm. and I don't mean to brag. Mm. I'm doing well, you know? You're doing very well on the YouTube I TV. I cut the cord. You know what I'm saying? Traditional what cable, Spectrum, this Time Warner, these Comcast things, you can keep it. I do. I get my cable from YouTube TV, so it's like a right. streaming cable. I record certain shows, botched, Vanderpump, you know, mm -hmm. you know, you know the thing. <laughs> and... Uh, I'm so I, I go to turn on a show that I've recorded and it goes, please enjoy these two minutes of ads. No longer. It's it wasn't on demand. I recorded it. I made the choice to record it. But now you are served ads, whether you like it or not, whether you record it or not. What are you nuts? Nuts. Right. That's, That's crazy. Nuts. Sorry. I, I have to. And I have to say quickly to that of YouTube TV, because I, I also have YouTube TV, and YouTube TV in general is completely nuts. Uh, <laughs> as a New Yorker, I don't know, Crumholtz, if you're a Knicks fan, I go to YouTube a, TV you, trying to watch- I'm a you, humongous good, Knicks fan. Good. Massive, I'm a like, diehard from die birth. Hard. Me too. We're, we're unbelievable. Never miss a game. Just want to watch Jalen and the boys do work. YouTube mm -hmm. TV, no MSG. There is no MSG you know you on YouTube get, TV. It, there is no ha. MSG. You got to do Fubo. Okay, Fubo. because you know what I'm now doing? I'm paying twenty nine ninety nine a month for MSG for Plus. Nothing. Right. That oh, is no, a no, what no. are you nuts? Fubo. Fubo. You know what? I'm done with these acronyms. That's another what are you nuts? It's all to be Fubo, boo boo, shoo shoo. Terrible. I, I'm a grown man. Yeah. <laughs> Terrible. Free v, well, free v. Free v. Well, Whatever. Well, the three, of us are gonna go to, the, the three of us are going to go to a Nick game. Last time Josh was in town, we went to that. a Nick game. I think it was Josh's first. It was unbelievable. Yeah, huge, we're diehards and we're, um, we're so all right, good. So it's my what do you nuts? <laughs> okay. I was going to say something political, but I'll keep it light because you guys kept it light too. Um, all right. Here's the deal. I'm on Facebook, right? I got a private. Account. Boomer. No, now I'm listen, kidding. Now, listen, now. Now, listen, now, hear me out. You know, you go on Twitter to Twitter, you want to be part of the snarky, like, uh, crowd commenting on the very latest news. You're on Instagram, you're sharing your pics, sort of bragging a bit about your life. Look at me. Will you look at my face today? Facebook, for me, was always, like, a way to keep in touch with, you know, Yuri Dalal, my friend in kindergarten. Sure. Who, you know, or people I've worked with on many sets, and that's it. In other words, friends only, mother friends only, meaning people I know that I've met that I've befriended. Mm. And then you get like the cousin of that friend. You get the sister of that friend and they send you a request and you ignore it because you don't know that person. It's not a public account. It's a private account and you ignore it and they send you another request. They delete their request and then re-request. Mm. What are you, nuts? Motherfucker, I don't know you. I don't know you, dude. I put pictures of my children. I even complain a lot. <laughs> on I'll even write, you know, I hurt my toe today. Stuff I would never write. On Motherfucker, I don't know you. This ain't a fan site. What are you, nuts? Friend friending yeah, somebody yeah. that you don't know on Facebook is the ultimate what are you, nuts?
I agree. Complete, a complete intrusion of privacy. I agree. What do you know? But it's all uh, absolutely what nuts. What do, what, what, you want part of me want to see my life? Mm. You don't get to see my life. Why? Because yeah. I, I know your fifth cousin twice removed. Yeah. Guess what? She's a lucky motherfucker. And if you ever want to see my life, <laughs> look at her Facebook page. Her, yeah. her, or <laughs> look at her Facebook feed Steal and maybe something login. will come up. I thought, I thought you were going to say, info. I thought you were going to say, and if you ever want to see your fifth cousin again, yeah, that's right. <laughs> you'll tell yeah. her to stop friending me. <laughs> but then I, you know, the problem is that then the re, the re request makes me <sighs> feel bad. Then I sit there and go, oh, now I feel bad. You know, they're probably out there going like, David Crummel's his dick. He knows my cousin. He won't even friend me. Forget that. You know, the entitlement on their end makes me feel like I am a dick. Oh, I unfollow. What am I nuts? I unfollow aggressively on Instagram and it Mm -hmm. feels so good. And I've had people go, what's with the unfollow? I'm like, that's life, Papa. Yeah. You're not on my feed. You weren't, you weren't catching my eye. Mm. I didn't like your content. Recently. I've unfriended on Facebook certain mm. people that I feel like, well, you know, our fling was brief as friends and they don't keep up with me on it. They're not going to. And a couple of them have noticed. Sure. And they have said they've re refriended. And then I have to refriend. Then I have to refriend. Then yeah. I have to be like, Aye. oh, yeah. And then Aye. you mute. God bless the Aye. mute button. The only person I have muted, I have 1,030 friends. You know, over the times that I, I'm old and I've worked a lot. And so the only person I'm muted is my sister. <laughs> that's that's yeah. very sibling. Yeah. Who I love dearly, but posts 18 times a day. Not too much. And, and I've told her that. Yeah. She knows. You don't love your nieces and nephews that much. I do. I think, but I think the, you I have. Can be, I can be texted. <laughs> right. Pictures jo- of Josh, would you agree that Crumholtz has the most active group of friends on Facebook on the app currently? It's it, next to my mom who literally will post screenshots of our text message exchange going, my son cracks me up mm. and it's, it's unacceptable. <laughs> yeah. On that note, David, That's amazing. Thank, you for, <laughs> thank you for coming on the Thanks, pod. Josh, we love you, dude. This is unbelievable what you people do here. You're the man. You so deserve good. it. It's a pleasure and we will... Uh, you we'll connect perhaps. soon. We'll connect right. soon. God, right. take us he out. Can't get, he can't get podcasts like this anywhere else. Rate no. this five stars. Otherwise, what are you nuts? Listen what to us nuts? on Spotify, iTunes, Apple. Watch us on Josh's YouTube. Share a clip with a friend. Recommend it to kids of all ages, young to old, whoever. Send it to somebody who needs to listen to the good guys. And uh, Mondays and Thursdays. We'll see you next time.